The Unshackled Waves, episode 35. Hello and welcome to the Unshackled Waves podcast. I'm Tim Wilms, here for this week's review episode. I'm once again joined this week by my co-editor-in-chief of The Unshackled, Sukath Fernando. Welcome again. Hello, everyone. Well, the focus of the news the past week has been elections. Uh, Just in the previous weekend, we had the Western Australian state election, which saw the Labor opposition win a landslide victory. It was a disappointing result for those on the right, and One Nation did not perform as well as people had hoped. There is now a lot of discussion about how the right should move forward and what lessons should be learned. Overseas, we have the first of the major European elections for 2017, which is occurring on Wednesday the 15th of March in the Netherlands. The anti-Islam and uh, and anti-open borders party for freedom, led by Gert Wilders, is a good chance to finish in first place in the Netherlands' multi-party proportional representation parliamentary election. But could he form government and become Prime Minister is the next question. Events of the past week have gone his way, with Turkey ordering its citizens in Europe to hold public demonstrations in support of a referendum to expand the powers of their Islamist president Erdogan. So we'll be discussing those topics. Uh, We'll start with the election, which uh, we did our our special live stream on Western Australian election night. So we saw the the results uh, un- unfold. Uh, at the beginning, we we knew that Labor was going to win, but by the end, but as the night progressed, uh, it was it was clear it was in landslide territory. Yeah, at first we knew because the polls were pointing towards the fact that Labour will win. Um, but you know, we didn't know it was going to be a landslide victory. You know, it was they won. They did quite well. Um, so yeah, I think uh, the the fact that it was a landslide victory was a bit um, surprising. But then again, it was also not surprising if you look at it closely. Yeah, I mean, but, but uh, the opinion rolls. Opinion polls were pretty much right. I mean, it was 54-46 to Labor uh, on the last poll that was released on Election Day. Now, I know that, the, especially in the American election, the, the polls were were wrong and also they were in Brexit. So we do have a degree of scepticism about them. But, yeah, they, uh, they were pretty spot on. And 54-46 is, is a landslide and that's what happened. Yeah, I think because um, the polls in Australia actually, in Western Australia, actually captured the fact that people want to change, for example. Um, you know, in, in America and in Britain, it didn't do that. I mean, in America, many polls themselves were rigged as well. Um, you know, we, we did see that, you know, the, the news polls could have been rigged. Um, there, were, there was evidence put um, forth in order to support that. And we know that the news agencies actually um, collaborated with Hillary Clinton. Um, and we also know that other polls that weren't as popular as the news polls um, showed that Trump might win. You know, we had professors, we had other other organizations that, that said, you know what, Trump might win this time because, you know, everything shows that Trump will win. And that's what happened. So remember, in Western Australia, the polls weren't rigged. In America, they were rigged. So, you know, there's there's that factor as well. I mean, in Australia, the, most of the time, the, the polls are, are, are pretty accurate. But let's uh, comment on why the Labor Party won. And you mentioned that it was people people wanted to change. Now, uh, both me and you on the night uh, ex- expressed our uh, frustration for the fact that uh, change isn't always good. I mean, yes, the, the Barnett government hadn't performed as well as we would have hoped from a Liberal Party, um, but Labor always turns out to be worse. And of course, my message on the night and in uh, my subsequent uh, wash-up article uh, was uh, was to Western Australians: don't say you weren't war- warned. Um, I hate to say, I hate to say, in a f- few years' time, I told you so. Yeah, I mean, the, the the thing is, you know, Labour actually had some 
policies that were considered good by most people. The liberals, their policies were quite unpopular. If you look at um, the privatization, that was a big problem there. In New South Wales, it was a different story. People wanted the privatization um, because obviously the eastern states are a bit different and you know the, the funding from the privatization, which was quite a large amount, was seen as more important than the fact that uh, state assets were being sold off. In Western Australia, it was a different story because in Western Australia, the funding actually you get from privatization wasn't as big as in New South Wales, firstly. So people would have thought that, you know, the the cost of actually privatizing it would have been much worse than the benefits. Um, so that's that's what people may have thought. That's what, And Labour capitalized on that. And and they actually won. They did well because, of, because they mainly centered on the privatization of the Barnard, Barnard government. Uh, privatization it's uh, it's never popular with the with the Australian people they're always skeptical of, of it I think the difference with when Mike Baird did it he uh, did it he was um, in a in a position of strength I mean he was easily going to win that election so he could afford to burn a, a bit of political capital but I uh, another re like I know that a lot of commentators have said that its time factor was was a big thing, but it was also uh, the fact that the budget was in deficit, the the economy had had, had gone uh, significantly uh, south uh, during the previous term, and the reason why people vote for the Liberal Party is because they want good economic management. And I said this on the night that uh, the voters thought, well, you haven't managed the economy well. I mean, that's what your great strength is, so we're not going to re-elect you. Yeah, exactly. You know, the as we said, we knew that the economic factors were the most important in the entire election. Like that was the benchmark. You know, they they, they didn't really look at it, other things. The economy was the most important factor because we all know the the Western Austra the state of Western Australia is going through change regarding its um you know regarding its de dependency on uh, resources and mining. And the mining boom is over. China's uh, economic growth is going is slowly sub sub subsiding. And now people are wondering, can the Liberal Party actually address that change? Can they provide something good in order to make sure that the state transition from maybe some from maybe a mining uh, dependency to a more services sector? So, you know, that actually that fundamental change in the economic outlook for the state was i suppose the main factor in allowing labor to capitalize on this you know saying that the liberals haven't done well the deficit etc 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 and therefore persuade people to vote for them by using the change in the economy as sort of a justification for a change in the government yeah, and it's also worth, I, I put this in my review article as well, that uh, Labour campaigned very conservatively. I mean, yeah, so they portray, and Mark McGowan portrayed himself as a safe pair of pans, you know, uh, sort of, although he didn't say it himself, it's, he gave the message that, you know, I'm not going to be like these radical uh, left-wing Labour, Labour leaders in the other states because he said that he was against a renewable energy targets and he said he wasn't going to, to raise taxes. Uh, but of course, as we've pointed out, uh, Labour is not to be trusted to, uh, even if they campaign on a conservative agenda, once they get into government, then they turn completely to the left. And we, and we saw a glimpse of that during the election campaign when uh, Mark McGowan came out in support of the Safe Schools Program program and euthanasia. Yeah, Labour um, actually did quite well in, on that front because the thing is they actually um, acted more moderately. You know, they they were st still overall left wing, but the thing is they their, their policies, their behaviour was much more moderate than what you would expect in, you know, Victoria, for example. Um, and you know people may have been persuaded by that and but the thing is you, you can't really trust labor can you because they always end up doing the opposite you know they they may act a particular way kevin rod acts in a particular way and said you know what i'm not going to change much from the howard era you know i'm just going to change a few things you know you can trust me next minute our deficit goes up okay because because we elected him so you know you can't really trust labor when it comes to that hopefully it doesn't happen this time um, but it could happen, and we <laughs> wouldn't be surprised if it happens. Yeah, that, yeah. That, that, that's that's why we say to to voters, don't say you weren't warned, because I, I'm a Victorian, and I've seen the the Victorian people throw out a mediocre coalition government and replace it with a far left Labor government under yeah. Daniel Andrews, and of course we're seeing the consequences of that at the moment. Yeah.
Now let's uh, reflect on the performance of One Nation. Now they didn't perform as well as expected. Uh, they didn't. They they didn't win any lower house seats. Uh, they look like they are only going to get two out of the three upper house seats that that they were aiming for. So there's been a lot of media commentary saying this was a a lacklustre performance uh, by by One Nation, and so uh, and a lot of. A lot of a lot of them are saying this is the beginning of the end for them. Uh, uh, they're falling apart just like last time, and of course, uh, a lot of criticism of the the preference deal that One Nation had with the Liberals. Well, both One Nation and Liberal Party have been criticised by their respective supporters for the deal. Yeah, firstly, we need to realise that one it is, isn't the end of One Nation at all. That's just sensa- that's just sensationalism because they won two seats in the upper. Well, they look like they won two seats in the upper house. That's good. That's okay. Um, not as much as we wanted, but again, that's okay. But yes, the left is capitalising on this and saying, "Oh, look." Um, it just goes to show that people don't want a racist party. You know, it just goes to show that uh, well, Di Natale actually says, you know, um, the fact that the, the Liberals didn't win because the, they did a preference deal with a racist, bigoted party. That's So they're all capitalizing, they're all attacking one nation because, you know, they, they all feel happy. Well, I think they're getting too happy because the thing is, um, the preference deal was a factor, but it's not, it's not because of what they think. You know, people, we had John Durakowski from... Who's, who was the youngest candidate for Western Australia in from One Nation, tell us that, you know, people didn't vote for One Nation because they didn't like the preference deal. They didn't want to vote for a party that actually did a preference deal with someone who criticized them since forever. Um, and that, that's a good point. That's a good point. I mean, because li- the Liberals have always been critical. Just like their leftist counterparts, the Liberals have always been critical of One Nation. And, you know, it may not have been very smart ultimately for Pauline to actually do a preference deal with that sort of person. Remember, the Liberals are considered to be a globalist group as well. Okay. The Liberals are only considered as, as you know, a better, as just a bit better than Labour by most people, and people didn't like the fact that Pauline did a preference deal with you know a party that was just a bit better, but still disappointing. Well, uh, Pauline commented in the aftermath of the election that the problem was is that they did a preference deal with an unpopular government, as uh, she said, yeah, you know, people went to the polls wanting to turf out Barnett and. When they heard about the preference deal, they thought, oh, why vote for One Nation? The preference is just going to go to the establishment guy who we hate. Exactly. That's another, that's the second reason. Because, you know, people didn't want Barnett. So, again, Pauline's decision wasn't very smart, ultimately. um, Because, you know, people didn't want to see the Liberals come back into government. And, you know, it might not have... the thing is, it might not have been very obvious at first. You know, the opinion polls weren't there back then. You know, it was a different story back then. People didn't really know much about um, you know, who was going to win. You know, there wasn't much actual analysis into it. But later on, we found out that people didn't want to win the government again. And therefore, it turned out it turned out that Pauline's decision wasn't very um, well thought out. That's okay because ultimately, the thing is, it was hard to sort of analyze the situation at the time when Pauline actually did the preference deal because you know it, it wasn't it wasn't really hard to um, sort of understand whether people wanted or not a new uh, to keep the liberal government um, you know which is again understand but again yeah the preference deal was the main reason um, because for all for all those reasons such as you know doing a preference deal with the liberals who aren't as good as people what people want it to be as well as the fact that Western Australians wanted to kick them out and get Labour in. Um, I do think One Nation would have would have done better if it went as an independent party because One Nation always does better as an independent party, you know, as its own party. It always goes through it always goes through adversity. It, it, it handles adversity very well by being its own sort of independent party instead of going off and making preference deals with Liberals or Labour. And that's what people wanted. And that's what people said, because, you know, they thought the preference deal was, uh, I suppose, the lesser of two evils. They they would prefer a Liberal preference deal over a Labour preference deal any day. But still, they didn't like the preference deal. And they didn't want to vote for a party that would, who's for a party, which might mean that the Liberals will keep being in government.
And it was also in, the, uh, as we reported in the in the week leading up to the election. I mean, the mainstream media really went after Pauline Hanson and One Nation. And of course, uh, the, uh, this uh, wasn't helped by the fact that there were a few ca uh, One Nation candidates and supporters who betrayed the party just a few a few days before polling day. Uh, uh, and of course, there, there's dissent in every party, but because the the mainstream media hates One Nation, of course, they they glowingly reported, oh, One Nation in meltdown, it's, fall, it's falling apart, and I, I think uh, this election demonstrated that mainstream media still hold a significant amount of influence over, over the voters because, of, uh, fairly or unfairly, there would have been a few voters who would have uh, consumed that media and thought, mm, I don't think I'll vote for One Nation. There would have been definitely a few voters who would have um, be, been persuaded by the mainstream media. However, I don't think the impact of the mainstream media this time was as big. I think their decision was purely based on the preference deal um, because you know they didn't want to indirectly help the Liberal Party get back into Parliament, get back into the government. So that's what I think. Um, you know, and the preference deal was it's what I think got them down. Because if one nation, for example, if one if Pauline Hanson was the Liberals, if she was the Liberal the Liberal Premier, then people would have voted for her, okay? But they didn't because, you know, the Lib because the Liberal Party was all about prioritization, which people didn't like, and Pauline Hanson was anti-prioritization, just like Labour. But remember, Labour had that and more. You know, Labour was anti-privatisation, Labour was you know, a, a, a bit, um, I suppose, um, socialist in some ways as well. But Labour had more than what One Nation had. As I said in the in my article, I said, you know, One Nation had what six pages in their website regarding Western Australia. Okay, Labour had a hundred and eighty-six page booklet telling them what they wanted, and that included anti-privatisation and more. So therefore, you know, Labour actually seemed more um, sort of sort of constructive in a way because you know Labour had the anti-prioritization, they had everything that One Nation supported, or many things that One Nation supported, and more. So I, I suppose that's a reason. You know, the, the media is going off saying, you know, One Nation is dead, you know, it just shows that people don't want this party. No, that does, it's not what it means. What it means is that, you know, people just didn't like the preference deal. They didn't want to indirectly get the, the Liberal Party back into government, and the Labour Party had what One Nation had, and more. Well, One Nation's got the uh, Queensland election, which will be, if not at the end of this year, at the latest early next year, which is Queensland has always been their strongest state. I mean, it's where Pauline Hanson's from. So uh, this will be the, the real test for, for how uh, popular One Nation is and, and whether they can really uh, break into the mainstream. Yeah, I think One Nation themselves would perform much better in the eastern states. Um, I don't think you know, the Western Australia is a good place for them. Because I think Western Australia is a bit too different. You know, the Eastern states are much more agrarian based. They're much more, I think they're much more conservative in a different way. You know, they're much more traditional than Western Australia. Western Australia is conservative, but I wouldn't say they're very traditional. Um, you know, and that sort of, that Pauline sort of um, old fashioned ideas, I don't think they would appeal to Western Australia much because they still, while being conservative, aren't, you know, very, very sort of reactionary themselves. So that's why I think Pauline didn't, you know, do that well in Western Australia. But yes, Queensland is much better and they can do much better in Queensland and places like New South Wales and Victoria because those eastern states seem to be much better suited to one nation. You know, we had polls saying that even migrants are supporting one nation now. You know, more and more migrants are supporting one nation um, because, you know, they like what she's saying. And, you know, so therefore I think it's much better for one nation to focus more on the eastern states first. Um, and, you know, increase their foundations there and maybe, maybe actually go a step forward instead of relying on the same thing they did in the federal election. In the federal election, they were, um, they, they had their campaign, you know, they said what they, what they said, but I think for a state election, they need to be more specific um, uh, instead of just relying on the federal strategy. You know, the federal strategy doesn't work in a state. You need to be more specific. You need to go further than what you did for the federal election um, and, you know, give them a more reasons as to why they should vote for them, as to why they are, as to why they are still relevant. So, you know, I think if they do that, then they will do much better in the eastern states.
Now let's turn to the results of the upper house. Now, as we said on the night, uh, the Western Australian Legislative Council still has uh, group voting tickets, which allows the micro parties to swap preferences with each other. Therefore, there's a greater chance of them being elected. Uh, well, that occurred uh, successfully on Saturday night. Now. The upper house results, they're the last to be counted. So uh, when, uh, when they first uh, came up on the, uh, on the uh, calcula uh, election calculator website on the, the ABC results site, uh, they were a bit all over the place. It looked like uh, some of the fringe micro parties, the uh, Daylight Savings Party and Fluoride Free Party were going to um, uh, win a few seats. But the few days later now, we've got a better idea of how the new upper house will look. And we mentioned that One Nation had won uh, two upper house seats. Uh, the Shooters, Fishers and Farmers Party, they have also won two seats. They had two seats in the previous uh, upper house. They have retained those. And also the Liberal Democrats look like picking up an upper house seat as well, which would give them their first uh, representative in a, in a state parliament. And the Labor and Green voting bloc will only be 17 votes out of 36, which means they'll have to get uh, the support of either One Nation or Shooters, Fishers and Farmers Party to get their legislative agenda through. So it was, uh, overall, it was a pretty good result for the, the minor parties. Yeah, I think, I think it's great that um, the Labour Labor only has 17 seats um, because that means there's a better, it's more favourable towards us because, you know, if they had more seats, it would have been easier for them to pass legislation through um, the upper house, which means they could have done anything they wanted. But now they can't because, you know, there's a better sort of um, checks and balances um, structure in the parliament now and they can't just do anything they want because they have to actually get support from other minor parties as well. Um, well I'm, so, I'm right-wing minor parties, which is the key thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Right-wing minor parties as well. So, you know, if that's the case, then, you know, they would have to um, conform to the right-wing will as well. So they can't just pass safe schools. They can't just pass, you know, whatever leftist radical thing they want to do, because it means they need to actually get support from the right-wing minor parties. And if they want to do that, they need to remain moderate. Yeah, and uh, luckily for us in Victoria, there is uh, some restraint on what the uh, Labor government can do because they don't have a majority with the Greens in the upper house. They have to get the uh, right-wing minor parties to vote for their legislation. So they were able to block the transgender birth certificate bill, which would have allowed anybody to change their gender on their birth certificate for any reason, and also the rollback of uh, religious uh, uh, liberty in Victoria as well so it, it, it's it's at least some of it's been blocked in Victoria yeah at least yeah um, and you know I think uh, the fact that one nation is in Western Australia is much better because now you have a much more um, traditional sort of right-wing party that is able to uh, you know be more um, hardline against radical leftist policies um, in Victoria there isn't really one nation but there isn't one nation so you know it's, it's easier for um, Daniel Andrews to pass his radical leftist policies in Western Australia is a different story because you know the, the right-wing parties um, how much the right wing parties have a much higher presence, especially the right wing minor parties, um, making it much harder to pass anything than it is in Victoria. So, which is a good, it's a, it's a good, it's a good situation for everyone. Well, for uh, us, for us, it's a good situation. Yeah. Although I did say yeah. in Victoria there is that right wing voting bloc that uh, can block the left uh, Daniel Andrews leftist agenda. There is, yeah, but I mean, they they weren't able to block the safe schools, um, whether they weren't able to block the oh, respectful uh, relationships. Oh, it was introduced safe schools back in 2010, uh, so it was it wasn't implemented in the life of this parliament. But anyway, that's more. That, 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 we're getting onto more technical matters now. Now let's talk about the yeah. uh, recriminations in the uh, Liberal Party, uh, which were to be expected. Now a lot of people are saying that obviously the preference deal uh, was a dud, and also people are saying that Colin Barnett should have um, been removed as leader in the lead up to the election. I, I, of course, the the media loves reporting on political recriminations, but overall, uh, I, I, don't, I don't think that there, well, on the federal level, I don't think there's, there, 
there should be much consequence for, for Malcolm Turnbull um, because it was an election based on uh, state issues. If there is a consequence from this election for, for Malcolm Turnbull, it's the fact that the polls are right and at the moment the polls for Malcolm Turnbull are very bad. Yeah, I don't think there would be an impact on the federal level. I do think the federal level did influence the state election, but I don't think the actual state result will influence um, federal politics as much as people think, um, because, you know, they're, as you said, they're mainly based on state issues, um, and, you know, fed, the federal level is, is different. It can influence the GST um, structure, however, but again, you know, there won't be a very large impact on the federal level. Uh, and uh, obviously there's recriminations at a state level as well, but even though this was a very bad re election result for the Liberal Party, um, I, as I stated in my wash-up article, that they can easily bounce back in, in four years' time. I mean, we, we don't have much hope that the Labor Party will be able to fix the, the budget situation, and most likely in 2021, the Liberals will be up against another Labor mess, and so they can, they can easily bounce back. I mean, this is just obviously a, a slight setback for, for the Liberal Party. Yeah, it doesn't look like Labour can fix the issue because Labour isn't very conservative when it comes to spending. The, this Labour government does seem more moderate, as we said earlier, but however, you know, the Labour Party isn't known to be very conservative. They're not meant to be very conservative when it comes to spending. Um, so I don't see how, because remember, Colin Barnett, he may have wanted to privatise um, the, the, the Western power, but the thing is, if he did privatise, then they could have paid the debt. Um, you know, they could have paid the $8 billion to the Treasury to the federal treasury um, and and I'm, I'm not sure how Labour is going to do that. Um, if they do, well, that, that will be, I suppose, it will be a good impact on everyone. However, I doubt they will be able to actually reduce the debt and, you know, bring bring the budget back into balance um, because Labour isn't known to actually do things that do result in economic conservatism. And the leadership contest for the uh, Liberal Party in Western Australia is looking like a contest between the uh, deputy, uh, who, who was the Deputy Premier, uh, Lisa Harvey, who is from the moderate faction of the party, and also former Minister Joe Francis has also put his hand up. He is from the Conservative faction of the Liberal Party, but he's also in danger of losing his seat. There's a few seats which are still too close to call. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's obvious to us that the Liberal Party needs to, you know, embrace its conservative base and, and supporters. And if they pick another moderate, it's just going to be, they're going to continue to going to look weak and mediocre and labour light. Yeah, they, they will, because people aren't going to want another left-wing major party. They want a conservative right-wing major party. Um, and if they if they betray their their right wing origin then it's just going to be have a negative impacts and you know we might see labor winning more and more um you know and that's not going to be good for anyone um as we saw when it came to previous elections in the federal level so let's hope that the Liberal Party does re-establish its conservative right-wing roots. If it doesn't, it'll lose, and hopefully it'll be replaced by a much better right-wing party, um, or maybe a better right-wing coalition. And, you know, hopefully, or else Labour will take, end up taking over the country. I don't think that will happen. I don't want to be too um, apocalyptic, but, you know, it's still quite a big concern these days. Yeah, I mean, there's a, a lot of talk about what this mean, this result means for the right in Australia. And of course, uh, with the less than expected One Nation result, a lot of media commentators are saying, oh, the, the popularity of the, the right is overstated in Australia and Malcolm Turnbull needs to stop uh, paying attention to his right flank. Well, uh, I don't think that at all. I mean, uh, Let's have a look at the campaign the WA Liberals ran. I mean, Barnett was a moderate conservative. He didn't campaign on many culturally conservative issues. I have, and I think a lot of people in the Australian community voted for Labor because at least they, they stand for something. I believe that if the, the Liberals had some courage and started to talk about the issues that, are, that we know, based on polling, are concerns to ordinary Australians, such as uh, immigration, uh, political correctness and the rise of cultural Marxism, I think if they demonstrated that 
you know, they, they're standing against these issues, that would, that would resonate with the Australian community. So, no, I, I, don't, I don't think this, this means that uh, the right's not influential in Australia. Oh, it definitely doesn't mean that because the right is still quite dominant in Australia. The thing is, Labor is better. The, the Western Australian Labor Party was better at standing up for what it's meant to stand up for. And people saw that, you know, uh, Mark McGowan, he was good at standing up for what Labor is meant to stand up for. Um, and that persuaded people because, you know, he's, he's a bit of a moderate, relatively he's a bit of a moderate. Left wing still, but moderate. And that's what Labor was always. Um, just right now, the leftist radicalism is taking over in the federal level um, and in some state levels. However, Mark McGowan was successful in sort of preserving that normal, the normal labor identity, which persuaded people. The liberals weren't doing that, and they need to start to switch to that, or else people will start supporting the person who has a much higher level of integrity. Okay, because the, liberal, the liberals are actually losing their integrity um, by, you know, caving in to the leftist rhetoric, by caving in to these progressive, uh, to this progressive agenda, and, you know, losing what, that, what they stand for. People want someone who's strong that stands up for what they're meant to stand for. And if the liberal party doesn't do that, then expect more results like this in the future. Yeah, definitely. Now let's turn uh, overseas now We've, and also move from an election review to an election preview. As we mentioned at the beginning, the yep. Dutch general election is occurring Wednesday the 15th, 20, uh, March 2017. Uh, now just uh, for, for those of our listeners who uh, are not familiar with how uh, the Dutch electoral system works is that uh, the Netherlands is a constitutional monarchy with a elected parliament uh, which has a prime minister. Uh, so the, the Dutch parliament it it's elected based on uh, proportional representation. So there are around about eight to ten parties who gain representation uh, in their parliament. And so government is formed by a coalition of parties because uh, no party gets a majority of seats in their own right, so they have to cobble together, together a, a coalition to form government. Uh, this is uh, not unique to the Netherlands. Uh, a lot of European uh, parliaments work like this, where the government is made up of several uh, smaller parties. Uh, but the the key issue in this campaign or, or the key talking point is this campaign has been the the slow rise of the leader of the uh, Party for Freedom, Gert Wilders, who for around about 15 years has been the, uh, an outspoken uh, anti-Islam campaigner in the Netherlands. Because if you think we've got our problems with Islam here in Australia, it's, pro it's about 10 times worse uh, in the Netherlands. Yeah, Europe is having a, a re really bad crisis. We know what's happening in Sweden, for example. Um, in the Netherlands, it's the Netherlands tends to be a bit more Eurosceptic than usual when it comes to uh, the, the voters. Um, so Geert Wilders is this Eurosceptic, um, well, anti-EU, anti-EU um, candidate who wants to have strong borders, who wants to actually implement some sort of civic nationalism, which is the normal nationalism, uh, the normal sort of light nationalism, I should say. And, you know, she, he wants to protect the country's freedoms, the country's values, the country's traditions, you know, and that, how is he going to do that? By implementing stronger borders, by making sure that they take their sovereignty back by getting the hell out of the EU. And implementing strong borders to keep Muslims out. He wants to ban Muslims, he wants to ban the Quran. Um, and for obvious reasons, it's a violent ideology, it's a book containing violent phrases, and so it's something that doesn't belong in the Western world, or really it doesn't belong anywhere other than where it came from. So, you know, I think Gate Wilders is doing very well. Um, Polish show that he's doing very well, and you know his style, his style of politics is quite good, similar to Trump, um, in a way because he does have a strong borders policy, but not a racist. People are calling him a racist. That is not racism. Civic nationalism is not racism. Um, so you know, I think I I, I well, we, we obviously endorse him, um, and I, I hope he does win. Uh, uh, similarities to Trump, people. A lot of people make the the point that his hair is similar to Trump's. Uh, Wilders yes. has got got a crazy, crazy hairstyle. But I've followed yes. Wilders for uh, a number of years before he uh, came to such prominence. I've read his book, uh, uh, "Marked for Death: Islam, 
Islam's war against the West and me because he has to have security with him 24 hours a day all the time. Like he basically has no privacy because uh, a, f yep. a former politician uh, in the Netherlands back in the 2000s was murdered for speaking out against Islam. The Dutch filmmaker uh, Theo van Gogh was murdered for making a film against Islam. So uh, he, he gets... He, he gets a lot of death threats and they're, they're taken seriously. And so that's why he's, he's, he's basically sacrificed having a normal life to, to pursue, pursue this issue, which he, which he believes is, is vital to securing the, the future of the Netherlands. So yeah, it's basically put his life on the line for this. And slowly the, the Dutch people who, uh, they're, they're ne what they're famous for the Dutch is tolerance but they're seeing what's happening with the, uh, the Turkish immigrants into the Netherlands, the Moroccan immigrants into the Netherlands, and they're seeing the crime and violence that is happening, the, um, the discrimination that Islam has against uh, women and homosexuals. And, and they're saying, th and they're, the, the Dutch people are basically saying we can't tolerate the intolerant. They're basically their tolerance is now being pushed to the limit, and that's why uh, slowly but eventually, uh, Wilders has risen to his party leading in some of the polls. Yeah, and for good reason, as you said, you know, Islam is a threat to the Western world. Islam is a threat to the Netherlands, and the fact that it's resulting in all, in all this criminal activity, in all this in this high terrorist threat, is persuading people to see the truth, to see logic, and to realize that Islam doesn't belong in their country. And that is why Wilders is performing so well in the polls. Um, I mean, I'm assuming that the polls aren't direct, assuming that the polls do capture what people think like they did in Western Australia. Um, so, you know, I, I do think he has a very good plan because people don't want to see, I mean, who in their right mind would want to see a religion responsible for such intolerance, responsible for such violence, responsible for such instability in in a peaceful, in a usually peaceful country? Um, and therefore, you know, why would they not vote for someone like Wilders? Yeah, and I, unless they're unless unless they're leftists, radical leftists. <laughs> if you if you look at the the polling. Uh, uh, for most of last year, Wilder's party was because there's there's ten parties. Obviously, the uh, what really matters is who's who's coming first, who's in the best position to take the prime ministership. Uh, Wilder's party was consistently in first position, but recently, the party of the current prime minister, Mark Rutte, uh, the People's Party for Freedom and Democracy, has retaken the lead. So it's going to be a close result. And Mark Rutte, the the party that he's a member of, is the establishment centre right party. He's trying to imitate Wilders by taking a more hard line against uh, uh, immigrants and the, the migrants that are currently coming in, into Europe as part of the migrant crisis. But, but of course, he, he's not proposing any uh, hard line solutions like Wilders is. And of course, you've been, you know, in, in the job for, uh, for, for nearly a, a decade. Uh, why haven't you done anything to addre uh, address th this problem? I mean, it's, you're, you're just showing your political desperation. You know, you're, not, you're only trying to save your skin. You're not, you're not, you don't really believe it. You're just interested in winning an election. Yeah, it's clear that he doesn't really believe in what um, Wilders is saying. He is he has switched to a more hardline approach when it comes to immigration. He doesn't really have any specific policies yet. Um, I am glad that this is happening, however, I want to say that it's nice to see that people are learning from, you know, these far right, well, far right, as they say, parties, um, because, you know, it shows that, you know, the right is still dominant. However, you're right in saying that he doesn't mean it. He could have done this for a very long time. He's been there for a very long time. He could have done something. He didn't. Um, he's only doing this because he wants to make sure that he's re-elected. Yeah. Um, he's been Prime this Minister is a trend. for six and a half years, been leader of the party for 10 years. So yeah, he's definitely been around for a while. Yeah, and this is a trend we see in many countries in Europe. So, for example, in Austria, for example, the the dominant centre-right party, equ equivalent to our Liberals, are now adopting a much more hardline approach to immigration. Now, Austria actually has implemented various things, um, and you know, they're doing quite well. Um, so, you know, Austria has learned from it. It's nice. It's nice to see you know mainstream parties learning from these um, sort of alternative right parties. However, you know, as you said. 
it's it hard. It's you cannot you cannot be sure first what if he doesn't mean it. Um, you can't be sure if he um will actually pro- make uh, fulfill these promises, and also you can't be sure if his actual policies, if he does mean it, you can't be sure if his actual policies are going to be as strong as what Wilders is saying. You know, Wilders, you can trust Wilders. You know what he's going to do. His policies are, policies are strong. With Mark Rutte, you can't really you can't really tell if his policies are going to be strong in the first place. Um. So yeah. Well, he doesn't want to get out of the EU. He's made that clear, and he's warned voters against uh, a move to populism. So he clearly is saying that Wilders, you know, will be bad. So he's he's trying to differentiate himself, uh, which shows to me that if re-elected, he would just you know do what the political class wants him to do. I mean, yeah, you're not going to. Why would you vote for a cheap? Uh, half-baked imitation of somebody when you can vote for Wilders, who's the real thing. Exactly. And, you, know, you know, vote for someone who's actually got everything right across the board instead of having one thing right, but then other other stances just being the same as what they were before. So, yes, I think Wilders, it's obviously, obviously Wilders does have the best um, policies when it comes to this campaign. And one of the the things to know about Mark Rutte, and this is, uh, I find, an interesting talking point, is that he's unmarried and childless. Uh, he's a he's a bachelor, and to me, that sort of I believe that sort of hinders his ability to be a good a good prime minister because because he doesn't have an investment in the future of the the Netherlands. I don't think, especially when it comes to um, issues such as immigration. He's, he, he can't empathise with those, uh, those Dutch families who are worried about the future for their children. And, and so, I th- so I think that uh, he, uh, that's affected by his inability to really address the immigration problem at the moment. Yeah. Now, some people would argue that you know, not having a family or not having children would mean that he has less to lose. Um, you know, it would mean that he can do more and then ha- sort of have less to lose as an impact. Well, the thing is, that can go both ways. Um, you know, he could use that as an opportunity to sort of keep doing the what they've been doing for a very long time, and because you know, he has nothing to lose, um, and he could keep doing, he would keep enacting the policies they've been enacting for a long time, keep being in the EU, keep um, sort of not fulfilling his promises. You know, saying something during the election just to make sure that people vote for him the next minute saying you know what i didn't mean that i'm going to change my mind and you know he could actually be easier for him because he has less to lose first and secondly yes he it's, he, it's hard of him to sort of understand and sympathize with actual families who do understand what it means to have this islamic risk at their doorstep who do understand what it means for ha- to have their children at schools that could potentially be harmed in very serious ways. So, you know, I think Wilders, in that sense, also gives a much better alternative to uh, the current PM. Yeah, definitely. Uh, now let's talk about the, uh, this issue with Turkey that's really flared up uh, in the days leading up to the election, is that uh, Turkey is holding a referendum to expand President Erdogan's powers. Now Erdogan has been there for a uh, president for around 15 years and he's become uh, more and more Islamist and more and more totalitarian ha- as time has gone by and Turkey is definitely moving in a more Islamist direction. And so uh, Aragon's been doing this pitch to Turks living in European countries to uh, pr- uh, protest in favour of the referendum uh, in countries such as the Netherlands, uh, Germany and Austria. And uh, they, uh, they've they actually uh, wanted uh, Turkish uh, politicians to speak at those rallies. Now, the governments of those countries have all blocked uh, these demonstrations from taking place. Well, in the Netherlands, the reasoning is that it poses a security risk and it will interfere in the days leading up to the election. Turkey has said that this is uh, anti-democratic, anti-free speech uh, move, uh, which, uh, which I, I think is a reasonable point, but then again, uh, the whole referendum is about giving Erdogan more power. And so, and it's, what's really concerning about this is the fact that there's these Turkish people living in European countries who are supposed to be assimilating into these countries, yet still have their loyalty to Turkey, whose uh, aims and interests are completely at odds with with those of uh, mainland Europe. 
Yeah, we expect them to assimilate to Western countries when they move to Western countries. And most of them do. Most migrants do assimilate. It's just Islamic migrants are a different story. And, you know, this is a great example of how Islamic migrants, instead of being you know, loyal to the country they live in right now, instead of actually assimilating and integrating to their culture, it shows that they still, they still, you know, pretend they live in Turkey. You know, this isn't Turkey, this is the Netherlands. So, you know, and it just shows that they are still involved in what's happening in Turkey and that their their priority is Turkey, not the country that gave them an opportunity, not the country that took, him, took them in and allowed them to live in the luxury of the Western world. No, they're their actual loyalty is still towards Turkey. Um, and if that's okay, we'll just, you know, just go back to Turkey then because your your actions don't belong in a country like, like the Netherlands because we expect you to assimilate. Um, I know, you know, I just think, you know, they, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good, good example of why we should continue to have a hard line approach against Muslims because Islamic migrants cannot be trusted with assimilation. Yeah, and and it's also it's quite sad what's happened to Turkey. I mean, uh, ever since the Ottoman Empire fell, it was a country based on secularism, but now it's moving back into the Islamist direction, and that is really uh, threatening the stability of Europe. And of course, uh, Turkey holds the uh, holds the door to uh, Europe, and so it, they can decide to let even more migrants cross into mainland Europe across their country. Yeah, I think that's and that's the, that's exactly why we need to make sure that right wing parties are voted in, because that would mean that they can they will be able to stop the migrants from coming in. You know, if they're right wing parties, um, who 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 are strong on border protection, they, they can make sure that Turkey's actions won't really have an impact on their countries. Now, if you have people like Merkel or people, you know, the emotional leftists who want to take in more refugees, and that's going to be a problem. So, you know, ultimately, it's our responsibility to, to protect. To, to, protect our own borders, um, which would mean that we need to have a right-wing party in, in parliament, in government. Yeah, and obviously we're hoping that this, uh, this developing story helps uh, Wilders do well. I mean, uh, there's yeah. been, these protests have led to rioting in the Dutch city of Rotterdam. So we hope that this, uh, because there's a lot of Dutch people who are still undecided, that helps uh, swing their vote to, towards Wilders. Um, but yeah, and you know, we actually saw that you know, that's actually happening right now because you know polls are now showing that nationalism is intensifying in the Netherlands. You know, polls are showing that the people have actually seen what's happening. The people have realised that you know these Turks are you know, probably on the brink of you know wreaking more havoc. You know, these Islamic migrants are probably on the brink of wreaking more havoc in the Netherlands. So uh, polls actually have shown that Geert Wilders, both Geert Wilders and I should say um, the current PM's party, they both have actually risen in popularity because the current PM did, I suppose, um, talk about stronger borders and did um, s switch to a much more um, hardline immigration approach. Um, and they have seen greater support thanks to uh, the fact that these Islamic migrants are now protesting in the streets, you know, contributing to more turbulence and therefore, you know, showing what they really are. I mean, all the other parties uh, in the Dutch election have said they, they won't form a coalition with Gert Wilders' Party for Freedom, but if he does well, uh, they might uh, change their mind. They might. They, there might be, you know, um, th there's the Christian, there's a Christian party who might actually um, go with the Dutch election. It was called, uh, sort of go well with the PVV. It was the Christian Democratic Appeal. Um, and they are also very um, Eurosceptic as well. So they do share some similarities with the Party for Freedom. So, and they would actually do well. Uh, well, the PVV, if they do well, they might actually um, start a coalition with them, and that might turn out to be good. Well, it's the first te uh, election test for the European right this year, so we're hoping for a good result. We've been so inspired, obviously, with Trump winning uh, last year that we hope that it that filters through to uh, the European elections. So after the Dutch election, there's the French election, uh, uh, French presidential election, I should say, and then also the German parliamentary elections in September later this year. So uh, we're hoping that this move towards uh, countries, you know, t uh, t taking back control of their destiny uh, continues.
Yeah, we hope that this, this does have a positive domino effect and you know, we hope that real this does win and become PM or actually increases its power and you know, we hope it spreads into France and to other countries that should um, have strong borders and should exit the European Union. Yeah, hopefully. Well, that's all we've got time for on today's show. So thank you, Suka, for joining me once again. That's okay. It's my pleasure. And a special thank you to all of those who watched our special Western Australian election live stream. Uh, we enjoyed it very much, and we're definitely going to do uh, more in the future, aren't we? We will, yes. We will do more live streams for important elections, not just in Australia, but around the world. And of course, we've uh, set up a, a post on the, the Unshackled website, which has got a list of all the videos uh, that we streamed that night. So they're all in the one place. So if you want to uh, go back and uh, see what we said that night, uh, uh, we'll leave a link in the description for you. And of course... Yes, please make sure to actually watch, watch them and, you know, Please give us feedback as well. Yeah. If you if you missed out on watching us on the night, we we went until yes. very very late, so not everyone stayed up for it. Yeah. And of course, the usual announcements at the end of the show. Don't forget to sign up to our email list at theunshackled.net slash subscribe. Uh, don't forget to s consider supporting the work of The Unshackled. You can become a patron on Patreon or donate via PayPal. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to the show on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, or view the video version on YouTube. And of course, don't forget to keep checking theunshackled.net on a regular basis for all the latest news. Thanks once again for listening, and we'll see you next time.